the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason not to want certain ideas to be expressed. Hello, everyone. I'd like to think that applause is for me, but it's not, but it's very polite. Thank you very much. Uh, Noam will be joining us shortly, um, but until then, I'll give you a brief introduction to the event, who I am, and how this is going to go. Uh, I'm Nisreen Malik. I'm a columnist for The Guardian newspaper. Um, we are speaking to Noam today, hopefully he'll be on Zoom, he'll be on a bunch of these screens. So for those of you downstairs, you'll be able to see him there, there and there. Um, there's a couple of screens, I think, behind and over there as well. So we should be covered. I will speak to him for about 40 minutes and then the audience has 20 minutes for questions. It's usually 15 minutes, but we thought we'd give it a little bit longer because there's lots to cover. Um, if you have any questions, please put your hands up, leave them up, and someone will come to you with a mic. Uh, we're very excited to have Noam today. It's a huge uh, honor, um, and there is a lot of ground to cover. So um, looking forward to getting started. No, that was a huge round of applause that you received from the audience here. We have around, I think it's 200 people in the auditorium and another about 500 online, I am told. Um, can you hear slash read what I'm saying? He, so just so you know, he, this is all on close captioning. Um, so it's not, it's not audio as far as Noam is concerned. Noam, can you hear slash read me? Yes, I can sort of hear and I can see. I can read the captions. Fantastic. Um, just to repeat, in case you didn't hear me or the first time, we have about 200 people here in Edinburgh in the auditorium, and we have another 500 or so online. Um, so there's a few hundred people listening to you today. We'll speak for about 40 minutes, and then I'll open it up for questions from the audience for about 20 minutes after that. Very good. Great. Um, so to kick off, we're talking about um, the book Chronicles of Descent, which is conversations with David Barsamian, um, and these conversations span decades about several issues. Um, but the first I'm particularly interested in is how the book kicks off and a theme that recurs throughout the book, which is the corporate press and your frustrations with the corporate, the corporate press. Um, and David says that the New York Times will want you, there's some hope that the New York Times in particular will one day get it right. What does the corporate press, as far as you see, get wrong? Um, and what are the avenues to fix it? Well, let's start with uh, something I read uh, about 75 years ago. Uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. Actually, more interesting is what I didn't read, namely the introduction to Animal Farm. I didn't read it because it didn't appear. It was suppressed for some reason which is unknown. Came out many years later in his unpublished papers. Read it then, perhaps you have. Not one of his greatest essays, but of some interest and it bears directly on this question. Uh, he, uh, the book, of course, is a satire on the totalitarian enemy, but the introduction is addressed to the people of England, 
free angle. What he says that shouldn't feel so self-righteous about this. Uh, in free England, uh, ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Gives a number of examples, not wonderful ones, a couple of reasons. One reason, he says, is uh, I'm basically quoting, the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason not to want certain ideas to be expressed. The other and more significant reason is just immersion in the prevailing culture. What Gramsci had called hegemonic common sense. Uh, if you've gone to the right schools, uh, you have, and in general, been absorbed into the prevailing culture, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say. I think we can go beyond that and say uh, things that you just can't think. They're just uh, beyond the frame of what is thinkable, even though they could be very relevant and important. Well, I think those are good places to start. Uh, since then, especially in the last 40 or 50 years, there's been extensive inquiry into how these results are achieved. And uh, many mechanisms have been investigated, thousands of pages of examples. Uh, you see more coming out daily if you read media criticism journals like Media Lens in England or Fair in the United States. Uh, many publications, uh, I keep writing about it, so do many others. The basic principle, I think, is quite simple. The basic principle of a conformist free press, one which wants to instill certain ideas and exclude others, the most effective way of doing it is to encourage debate. So it seems that there's a range of ideas and controversy being expressed and controversies going on but to arrange it so that this debate is within a framework, an unspoken framework of presuppositions, which are not expressed and not seen and maybe not even perceived, but they just set the bounds. If you go beyond those bounds, you're excluded, uh, maybe vilified, marginalized in one way or another, but within the bounds, you can have, and you're encouraged to have, lively debate, which makes people feel reasonably that they're being exposed to uh, the whole range of opinion. There's no need to look anywhere else. That's quite different from totalitarian systems of uh, censorship. There, it's very visible. Here's the censor, I'm canceling that. You say this, you're going to go to the prison camp. It's very straight, very clear. I'm, of course, exaggerating for simplicity, but it's pretty much the division. It has interesting effects. So, for example, uh, about 40 years ago, there were an interesting, some interesting studies carried out by a U.S. Uh, academic centers, government-supported academic centers, Russian research centers, they were trying to determine in the 1970s, the period of sort of transition between the rigid Stalinist system and the more open Glasno system that emerged right at about that time. But they were asking during this period, 1970s, where were Russians getting their information? And they studied uh, emigres, whatever information, the sources they had. 
and reached some pretty astonishing conclusions. Conclusions were that the large majority of Russians were getting their information from sources like BBC and the Voice of America, which were of course censored, but it was sort of soft censorship with a little effort, you could find your way around it. And since the official media were so brass and crude that basically you didn't believe them, people did look for other sources. Could turn out that in this period, Russians were better informed than Americans because they were looking beyond the other sources. Uh, that's it's an interesting topic, not much investigated, interesting topic to look into. Well, let's see how it works with us. Uh, just innumerable, as I said, there's thousands of pages of examples, uh, more coming out every day from uh, media critique sources and others. So let's take something right on the front page headlines. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a careful, detailed, well-researched, deeply researched, comprehensive account in the Washington Post of the buildup to the Ukraine invasion. Very valuable document. Studies this in extensive detail, carefully done, well documented. Different opinions discussed, lively debates. If you look at it closely, you'll notice that there's a presupposition. There is not a word about the option of avoiding the war or of negotiations, diplomatic settlement to try to end it. That's off the agenda. So just on that note, sorry to interrupt, to interrupt you, on that note, what are the sorts of things you said at the beginning of the answer that in the corporate press, there are certain things that you cannot say. Um, this is one example that you believe is um, in the contemporary era about the Ukraine war. But generally, what are the themes that you have found over the years at the corporate press, or as we call it here in the UK, the mainstream press, um, is not allowed to cover? Exactly what I discussed. The long, comprehensive analysis conforms to the general pattern by discussing the various different ways in which we can fight the war, what tactics could be used, what kind of weapons, what should be done, does not discuss the, cru the crucial question of could the war have been averted? If it could, why wasn't it? How could it be ended instead of the horrible atrocities continuing. So for example, there's no mention in the comprehensive study, and you won't find it in the press, of uh, uh, say Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov's uh, discussion a couple of weeks before the war about how the issue, the one issue that must be dealt with is Ukrainian neutrality if indicating, not proving, but indicating that if the U.S. and its Britain and their allies had been willing to take into account this concern, maybe the war could have been averted. Uh, actually, I won't say that nobody talks about it. So if you look in the British press, you can, for example, see uh, comments by Jeremy Corbyn saying, look, the war's going to end someday in negotiations. Why not now? It's one of the reasons he was kicked out, practically kicked out of the Labour Party. So yes, the words could be expressed, but uh, with the usual reaction. Well, if you look a little further, you find out that there's been a kind of split between the US and Britain on the one hand, super hawks and continental Europe on the other, where there were initiatives actually going up to about four days before the invasion from Macron in France to try to see if you could 
with Putin, see if he could find some common ground to avoid the aggression and to lead to accommodation. They were inconclusive, but not zero. You can read about them in the French press, you can get the whole transcript. Um, there is an official position of the United States followed loyally by Britain, uh, by now pretty much accepted by NATO after the war began. The official position, official position is the war is first of all, before the war, the State Department conceded explicitly that before the war, that we do not take Russian security concerns into account. This one Russian security concern has been well known for 30 years, uh, well before Putin, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, it's been Russian position. No Ukrainian entry into NATO, it's a red line. Uh, every uh, U.S. official with uh, any knowledge of Russia has been emphasizing to Washington for 30 years that it is reckless and provocative to try to cross this red line. And if you do, Russia will probably go to war, no matter who's leading it. Uh, current director of the CIA, William Burns, expressed this clearly, his predecessors did. Uh, Jack Matlock, Russia's uh, uh, George Bush, number one's ambassador to Russia, one of the leading Russian experts, uh, George Kennan, many others, uh, ignored. The position is we do not take Russian security concerns into account, including the red line. Understood. I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to segue a little bit now from um, the point about the corporate press to how you reconcile that view that the corporate press is sort of steeped with the interests of the wealthy and the powerful and the elite, and how you reconcile that with your stance on free speech. Um, there was a letter uh, in Harper's Magazine, which I'm sure you hear about a lot, um, but just to reintroduce it to the audience, it's a letter that was signed by um, a few public intellectuals a couple of years ago, um, upholding the values of free speech and saying that it was under attack um, by sort of left-wing or progressive or liberal minorities. And I'd just like to quote to you a brief section of that letter where it says, the free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. While we have come to expect this on the radical right, censoriousness is also spreading more widely in our culture, an intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues into blinding moral certainty. How do you reconcile this sort of absolutism about free speech and the voices that are allowed to speak about important issues today with the view that the kind of platforms for free speech are captured? Well, first of all, the Harper's letter was about a totally different issue. Happy to go into that, but make it clear that it's not what we were just discussing. What we were discussing, beginning with Orwell up to today, is how the mainstream media constrain thought by encouraging debate and discussion within narrow constraints. The unspoken presuppositions that basically are what you might call the party line. This is another topic. Uh, this is a letter which I should say I, I signed, but with some reservations. The reservations were that it was very misleading the letter was talking about, the Harper's letter was talking about what's called the, these days cancel culture, meaning efforts by segments of what's called the left, usually young, to prevent speech that they don't want to hear. 
like to prevent the speakers from coming to campus who they don't want to hear or uh, uh, impo making it, as you said, uh, uh, imposing uh, shame and others on views they don't like. Uh, well, I don't think that should happen. So therefore I did agree to sign the letter. The reservations were pretty much what we've been talking about, the presupposition that this is something new that's happening from segments of the left. In fact, it's as old as the hills and the main targets have always been the left. I could give you plenty of examples just from my own experience. Uh, starting, for example, with, uh, I've written about these topics with my late friend, Edward Herman. Now, the first book that we published, which was uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, 20,000 copies of the book were published, small publisher, uh, uh, very, pretty effective publisher, uh, an executive of the conglomerate that owned the publisher, saw the book, didn't like it, uh, ordered the publisher to stop distributing it. Publisher refused. It's very simple, put the publisher out of business, destroyed all its stock, our book and all its other books. Did anybody call that cancel culture? It didn't cause a wrinkle. I can give you case after case like that. I mean, I'm pretty protected, pretty well known. There are others whose careers are destroyed, uh, banned from uh, positions, banned from publication, uh, demonized, and so on. It goes on forever. That's the mainstream media and the mainstream corporate system. But you don't talk about it. It becomes an issue when segments of the left pick up some of the worst habits of the mainstream and improperly apply them to people who the mainstream likes, then it becomes an issue. Well, that's an illustration of what I was talking about in another domain. So yes, I signed the letter, but with these reservations, I should say that the letter itself was so innocuous and anodyne that I was kind of embarrassed even to sign it. Basically, the free speech is a nice thing. Uh, but it, what was interesting about it was the reaction. It elicited a furious reaction uh, from part, much of what's called the left about how dare you say this and so on. But why do you so, think the reaction was so furious? Because the letter, though anodyne, did strike at something. The tendencies on a part of segments of the left to try to suppress what they don't want to hear. That's wrong and it's self-destructive. But apparently there's so much commitment to it that just making the point simply caused a furious reaction. You, you don't think that there is any element in there of the response which was a sort of frustration or anger with these mainstream organs, these sort of prestige publications, of which Harper's is one, um, that sort of dictate or lecture the rabble about how they should behave when it comes to how they are abused or talked about. There's two things going on here, I think. There's the incidents of council culture, quote unquote, which you mentioned. Um, which I think are quite difficult to collapse into the responsibility of one particular party. But parallel to that, there is also a large cohort of minorities, um, sexual, racial, uh, ethnic, gender minorities, who have not had the opportunity to speak through these very prestigious publications. Um, and so what I felt about the response to the Harper's letter is that it was a sort of lecturing of these upstarts from legacy established institutions and figures. Um, and and I, felt, I, I think that that's something worth engaging with. 
like engaging with, sorry. So I think the sort of sensitivity of minorities when they are told that their response is unreasonable, uh, I think is worth engaging with. Well, there's two things. We have to make a distinction, crucial distinction here. One kind of criticism of the Harper's letter is it suppressed the fact that cancel culture has been the mainstream uh, commitment forever against things it don't like. That's a fair criticism of the Harper's letter. That's not what I heard. It's the criticism I just made. That's, I think, a fair and appropriate criticism. But to say it's wrong to, to, to criticize those who are trying to suppress speech, that I don't that's what I heard. So you have to ask what the criticism of the letter is. There is a very valid criticism, namely its presupposition that this is something new. It's not something new. It's old, goes on all the time, perfectly fair, valid criticism. In fact, I made it right away. But uh, a different kind of criticism is defense of the cancel culture saying, how dare you criticize for trying to silence people? Understood. So on that point, what is your view of identity politics as a useful or damaging uh, influence on the left at the moment? It's a mixed story. Identity <laughs> politics covers a pretty wide range. When identity politics brings up genuine cases of repression, often violence, uh, marginalization of uh, minorities, uh, groups that aren't like them, what Orwell called unpopular ideas, uh, in that case, identity politics can be very valuable. On the other hand, any kind of politics, any kind, ever, this second nature to any activist is when you carry out some activity to try to bring people to look at the world differently, maybe to join you in your cause. Whenever you do that, you ask yourself, what is the effect of my tactics on the audience that I'm addressing? You don't say, this makes me feel good, I'm going to do it. Not if you're a serious activist. It's not enough just feel good. What you want to do is do good, not feel good. Uh, it doesn't matter what the issue is. Climate politics, uh, identity politics, anything else. So if you're serious, you ask yourself, what's the effect on my intended audience? of the tactic I'm going to undertake. Let me take you back uh, to something far enough in the, in the back so we can look at it uh, without too much uh, emotional involvement. Let's go back to the, the latter stage of the Indochina Wars, where there was by then a substantial peace movement. It took many years to, for it to develop, a lot of hard work. But finally it did emerge. Well, at that point, you had young people who were so outraged by the war that they decided, I just can't use the ordinary methods of opposition anymore. I have to march down Main Street and break windows. Uh, I have to smash up banks. I have to set off a bomb at a research center. It's just so far beyond. The atrocities are so awful. I can't keep to the measures of uh, the... Uh, uh, that you people are advising, like uh, debates, arguments, teaching, demonstrations, pressures on Congress, all too mild. I'm going to go out and really sh get wild. There were, I was very much involved in this at the time, a lot of young people. This is basically the weather underground. In fact, some good friends of mine uh, ended up going to the jail. It's one case for 30 years, couldn't talk her out of it. 
But uh, what was the effect on the target audience? It was to increase support for the war. Very definitely. Very clearly. You do things like smashing up stores on Main Street. How do you think ordinary people are going to react when they don't understand what you're doing? And the, you see it at, what is the alternative route? So maybe this is a kind of binary example. It doesn't necessarily have to be violence versus a more studied approach. But let us, let us assume that there is so much frustration, for example, with the Black Lives Matter protests a couple of years ago. There is so much frustration and there is such a sense of complete disenfranchisement that the only way these issues can be brought to public attention is via spilling out onto the streets. What alternative methods are there for people who do not see any route to voicing their concerns or being heard, who see this as a last resort? Well, let's take a look at that and see what happens. We're talking about the response to the Floyd murder. It was a tremendous response, very effective. Some of the hugest demonstrations maybe in American history, enormous public support for the demonstrations. Uh, the uh, activists in Black Lives Matter were trying to cut down the acts of looting and violence Take a look at what was actually going on in the streets. The activists were saying, keep to the nonviolent actions. Because if you start breaking into a store and looting it, you're just gonna turn people against you. And you're gonna turn people against what we are trying to do. That's exactly the point. Serious act committed activists like the Black Lives Matter organizers understood that you shape your tactics to bring about understanding and support, not elicit antagonism. That's elementary for activists. Well, it was ignored by the weather underground for very bad negative consequences. I should tell you that the Vietnamese themselves were strongly opposed to those tactics. We had discussions with them in Paris, which could have discussions. They pleaded, don't undertake those tactics. They didn't care if young Americans felt good. They wanted to survive, which meant they wanted tactics that would increase opposition to the war. If you heard what they were proposing, the Vietnamese at the peak of the war, you might be surprised. They were proposing tactics so mild that the main peace movement in the United States wouldn't even think of them. Like I remember a discussion in Paris at about this time where the Vietnamese participants were saying that what they really respected was when a group of women in the United States uh, stood in silence uh, near the graves of soldiers who had died in Vietnam. That they thought was really effective, not breaking windows on Main Street. As I said, they wanted to survive, not have young Americans feel good. Well, go to Black Lives Matter. Pretty much the same. Uh, the activists and organizers were trying to keep it nonviolent even to make set up relations with the police of cooperation. That made sense. There were fringes. Nobody knows who they were, maybe provocateurs, who were breaking into stores, looting them, acts of violence, the organizer trying to stop them. And the same went with other issues. Take the slogan, defund the police. That had a sensible meaning which could have been put forward and was they tried to put it forward, which could have brought substantial popular support and popular gains. It was articulated by leadership. The idea was actually 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said it pretty well. She was asked, what do you mean by defund the police? She said, make the police something like what they are in an affluent suburb. Police in an affluent suburb, if some kid has a drug problem, they don't beat him up and send him to jail for 20 years. Uh, they try to deal with the problem, uh, use community service, uh, get the kid on the right path and so on. Okay, that's defund the police. Uh, cut back uh, act police activities that don't belong to the police at all. Large percentage, overwhelming percentage of police activities. There's no reason for trained police to be involved. Uh, things like, say, overdoses, uh, domestic disputes, uh, lots of other things like that can be handled much better by community service. Understood. Understood. Sorry to interrupt you. I have one more question for you before I have to give you to the audience. Um, so I just need to ask, just to round off the conversation um, between you and I, there seems to me a sort of tension at the heart of this understanding that one cannot speak the truth through the organs of power. And once one seeks the truth, they're excluded from power. So you gave the example of Jeremy Corbyn, for example. Um, so that sort of necessarily entails that there is no way in. There is, there is no way to reform it. There is no way that outsiders can in any way shape the language, the rhetoric, and the sort of paradigm of truth. Is, is there an avenue in your mind um, or an alternative avenue to these mainstream organs of power that are kind of pro-war, uh, pro-capitalism, uh, pro sort of propagandic address. Is there an avenue to those people who want to speak truth to power, but, will, that, but do not want to be automatic, automatically excluded from the conversations? I just find it difficult to see, you know, if, if the corporate press and even the language of politics is so captured, what avenues are there? I agree with you that one shouldn't waste time speaking truth to power. I've been saying that as loud as I can for 50 years. What you do is try to bring truth to the powerless and then organize them so they can act, impose pressures to which the powerful will respond. In fact, maybe even overcome and eliminate the powerful. That's what activism is. You don't accept the paradigm of, let's go talk to uh, our Congress and say you're wrong, no, that you don't bother with. I said, my late friend, uh, Howard Zinn, who you probably know, he, his 100th birthday would have been yesterday. Actually, the two of us did once go down to war, at the peak of the Vietnam War, I go down to Washington to talk to our congressional representatives. It was interesting, I could tell you what happened, but that's rare. That's not what activism is. It's one of the things you do for experiment or education. What you do is go to the people in the, in the communities, in the streets, in associations, try to bring them to think through the issues outside the framework of what the powerful impose and organize, become active in imposing the kinds of pressures that matter, alternatives that matter. That's the way achievements are made. And to say it's impossible is just a mistake. We have many examples of where it's very possible. Just compare our countries with what they were 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I'm going to take the United States. Uh, back in the 1960s, before the activist movements, there was no talk about women's rights. In fact, women were regarded as property. They didn't have the official uh, rights of peers until 1975, 
It didn't happen by talking truth to power. It happened by women's organizations beginning back in the 60s on a very small scale. Small groups talking to each other, consciousness raising sessions, making larger appeals, finally became a major wave, changed the country enormously. Same was true of the anti-war movement. It literally started with talking to people in their living rooms. Of support for the war was so overwhelming, you could barely discuss it. In Boston, where I lived, which is a liberal city, we could not have public demonstrations until about 1967, because it'd be broken up by violence. Well, finally it worked. I understood. I have, to, I have to stop being selfish now and hand you over to this kind audience. Um, we have a few questions online and a few questions in the auditorium with us, Noam. Um, and so a mic is going to go to people in the room to ask you some questions. If you cannot hear, uh, I will repeat it back to you on the closed captioning. Yes. Hi, Noam. If you had uh, three points that you would like to make to uh, Joseph, uh, President Joseph Biden, what would they be? Okay, what would it be? Well, first of all, we have to recognize, again, this fallacy of truth to power. I could go talk to Biden, it wouldn't make the slightest difference. Uh, if the Sunrise Movement, young activists, sit in on Nancy Pelosi's office and demand, say they're not going to get out until something is done on climate change. And if the Capitol Police don't just come and arrest them, but they get some support from, in this case, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the young women who came in on the Sanders wave, she comes and stays with them. Capitol Police can't go out. Goes on like that, more similar activities. You get pressure and Biden had a pretty decent climate program because of these activities, not because somebody came to his office and said, uh, how about doing something on climate change? Well, we could go on with what happened afterwards, but that's typical. What you want to do, I mean, uh, I could, you know, that's exactly what engagement and activism is. When you have popular power behind you and popular understanding, popular pressures, then you can go talk to Joe Biden or whoever your representative is and says, you better do this or else. Okay, then you can get somewhere. And it has effects. Thank you. Up top, yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, words that are inspiring uh, as ever, Mr. Chomsky. Um, picking up on your notion of community organization, community activism, uh, I'm very inspired by the example of the Black Panther movement, much more than by Black Lives Matter. Uh, and I wonder if you could reflect on what, what happened to such a well-organized uh, community organization as that, and why that kind of organization failed? Why the Black Panthers failed? Well, actually I was pretty much involved with Black Panthers at the time. It's not so much that they failed, they were destroyed. There was a major there were about 800 Black Panthers altogether, according to the FBI. Uh, there were different groups of them. There were serious organizers. Uh, there were others who were just basically thugs pulling in to see if they could pick up something. Uh, they had to make a distinction between them. Some people didn't. Like the friend I mentioned, this young woman who spent 30 years in jail failed to make the distinction, other cases like that. But there were very serious activist organizers. 
One of the major ones was Fred Hampton. What happened to Fred Hampton? He was assassinated by uh, Chicago police set up by the FBI in a Gestapo style raid. Okay, that's what happened to the Black Panthers. Uh, they didn't have enough outside popular support to block this. They didn't have ways of overcoming the internal conflict. And uh, the best people among them were just either killed or marginalized or destroyed by major, this was one of the major FBI uh, operations of the period. Uh, the FBI is basically the national political police. And this is main thing they were involved in. You want to look at the details. They've, a lot of it has since come out in print and declassified material, co-intel pro papers and other things. Um, in the case of Fred Hampton, I have to be personally involved. But uh, these, um, with my friend Howard Zinn, who I mentioned, two of us were closely involved in Panther activities, trying to support the constructive, effective kinds. Uh, the Black Lives Matter was different. That the popular support was so enormous that it was quite effective. It took devious methods, indirect methods, to try to undermine they, what they were doing. I was trying to get to this with the defund the police issue. There, if I can have a minute to pursue that, as I said, there were very constructive versions of defund the police, uh, which could have received enormous public support, in fact, police support. Uh, police don't want to be involved in things that are none of their business, finding lost dogs, uh, picking up an overdose and so on. Uh, all part of the defund the police proposals were to increase funding for the police because they're defunded, they're underfunded, and have them restricted to police activities, community service, and so on for other things. Well, in the debate and discussion, that lost out. The right wing was able to take it over, win the battle of discussion and debate, and turn defund the police into something like uh, you go into a poor community and you say, uh, where there's a lot of crime and where they want police, and you say, these guys want to take your police away. They want criminals to run the place. Well, you let them win the battle, they win. They don't have to. That's what serious activism would be about. It's a case where... Understood. Uh, we, have, we have one more question from the audience. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chomsky, I never thought I'd sit in a room and have... Uh, such an exciting hour as this with you. Thank you so much. I'd like to take I'd like to take you back a little further in time and I'd wonder if you'd give some reflection upon another great radical and community activist, Mahatma Gandhi. What do you think of him and what do you think of the effect on his various audiences, not just in India, but in his famous visits to these islands as well. Thank you. Well, he was obviously a very significant figure who achieved a great deal. You can find criticisms, uh, but overall, I think his impact was extremely positive. Uh, his impact was in leading the great marches, the uh, boycotts, uh, he had a major effect in overcoming one of the worst crimes of the modern era, British imperialism in India. Hideous story, hundreds of years of devastation, destruction, mostly suppressed in England. It's interesting that just very recently, very recently, the last couple of decades, some of the truth is finally beginning to leak out. Uh, work like, say, Carolyn Kennedy's recent book, Chessie Theroux's recent book and others, beginning, Brit British are finally beginning to understand the hideous crimes they carried out in India, plenty of other places. 
Well, Mahatma Gandhi was, played a very significant role in bringing this to an end. Not a very attractive end, I should say. Again, more British criminality and deceit at the very end, which led to powerful outcomes. But it was a major achievement. And I think Gandhi gets a lot of uh, credit for having been in the center of that with his approach of nonviolent activism. It turned out to be very successful. You know, I have a couple of questions from our online audience, which we mustn't neglect. Um, one is, I'll put them together because they're quite brief. One is, if you still think that Russia is merely seeking to demilitarize and neutralize Ukraine, given clear statements from Russian officials that the goal is the occupation of the country and its annexation. And the second question is, what are your views on how the English and also Scottish press, this might be a little bit inside baseball, but let's have a go. What are your views on how the English and also Scottish press deals with the question of Scottish independence? Oh, well, on the first question, uh, the fact of the matter is we do not know with any precision what Putin's goals were. There are two versions. One version is the Western version. He's a madman who wants to conquer Ukraine, uh, re restore the Russian Empire. Uh, Russia is... Uh, he, and he's got to be stopped now or there'll be fascism all over the world. And basically the Western line. There's another possibility, namely what they've actually been saying. What have the Russians actually been saying? What have Western diplomats who know something about Russia been saying? It's a different picture. They say there has been a Russian red line for 30 years will tolerate your violation of the pledge, firm pledge not to move NATO to our borders, will tolerate it, but not when it involves incorporation of Ukraine into NATO. That's a red line. Uh, you look at a topographical map, you look at history, you can easily understand it. So what, this, what they've been saying is, right up to the invasion, the crucial issue is integration of NATO, with, of Ukraine within NATO. Well, could that have been pursued to avert the war and maybe to move to terminate it now? Only one way to find out. Try. Put it to them, say, okay, we'll consider that. Uh, let's see if you can live up to that claim. What would the answer be? Only fanatic ideologues know the answer. Uh, human beings like us don't know the answer. And you can't find out the answer unless you try. That was basically Corbyn's position, part of the reason he was tossed out of the Labour Party. How dare you be so reasonable? Uh, okay, well, that's, uh, I should say he was tossed out with broad media support, uh, not just the Labour, not just Starmer. But uh, the, uh, uh, on, on the second issue, uh, frankly, you ask my personal position, not that it matters, it doesn't. I mean, I'd be in favor of Scottish independence, but it's not up to me. Up to the if they want it, I think they should be able to move in that direction. There's a lot at stake. It's not a simple matter. There are many consequences. So you can't just say, hey, do this, it's a great thing. You have to think through the consequences. But fundamentally, somebody asks my opinion, I can say, here's what I think, but it doesn't mean anything. You have to decide what you mean for yourself, what you want for yourselves. And then if you decide on independence, I think that should be a possibility. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Do you think it's that straightforward if there is a corporate and mainstream press that has agendas about the unification of, the, the sort of retaining the unity of the United Kingdom post-Brexit, 
um, is I think it's a little less straightforward than people just deciding what they want. Well, my own view for what it's worth is that Brexit was a major error. I think what it does is drive Britain deep into the pockets of the United States. Big benefit for Washington-based imperialism. I think it'll be harmful to England, harmful to Europe. It's my own opinion. Post-Brexit, tricky situation. Uh, it seems to me pretty unlikely that uh, Britain can hang together in anything like its traditional form, or maybe even that it should. Maybe it should be become move towards more federalism. Uh, I hate to express uh, sentences about this because too much is at stake. There's a lot of complications and consequences. And just to say, here's what I think, is very misleading. You have to connect it to all of the consequences that follow, like say unification of Ireland. Personally, I think that's a good direction to move towards. Always have, but it's one of the And just to say, here's what I think is not enough. There's a lot at stake. Lot um, I have, thank you, Noam. Uh, I have one last question, which is how the book uh, starts. Uh, do you still grind your teeth at night? <laughs> do I still grind my teeth at night? Well, I, I think other people don't know the story. Uh, my, I had, many years ago, uh, my wife made me go to the dentist. I was, she said I was, uh, my, my teeth were ground down, something was wrong with them. And the uh, dentist looked at it and said, yeah, you got a problem with your teeth. So what's going on? And I said, I don't know. And my wife said, he grinds his teeth at night. And I realized that at night, during the day, it's so frustrating. All the spending life in these difficult, painful activities, nothing, all kind of horrors. At night, I was grinding my teeth. Uh, you know, I tried to stop. I don't seem to have a problem. Take it out in other ways. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Noam. You won't be able to hear it, but you're getting a humongous round of applause now from the audience. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. Uh, that was about 90 seconds of applause there. Thank you for joining us. I want to say to the audience, the book Chronicles on Descent is wonderful. It's wide ranging and it spans three decades. So if you'd like to read it, it's on sale downstairs. For our audience online, thank you very much for joining us. If you would like to support uh, the festival, please wait, play what you can. There is a link, uh, and it helps the festival uh, a long way in achieving its goals. I'm Nisreen Malik. You've been great. Thank you very much.